The history of slave rebellions concerning Afro-descended people are largely glossed over. Not much attention is given to them in popular culture. Sometimes historians themselves have a tendency to remain on the surface level when it comes to the details. Thankfully, in modern times, some have decided to take a closer look at the African cultural connection between one of the largest slave rebellions in American history. What up African world, it's Home Team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. If you like this content, consider supporting the Home Team on Patreon.com. There you can have access to sources and more in-depth full courses on African history. And with word from my sponsors, there's a new social media platform dedicated to educating and uplifting our people. No longer do we have to be censored for speaking our truth. Our Black Truth is black owned and operated and a place where you can post your businesses and even monetize your content. You can download the app at Google Play or the App Store and you can visit the website at OurBlackTruth.com. Links to everything in the description box below. One of the most well-known rebellions amongst enslaved people is the Haitian Revolution in which Africans rose up against the French defeating them in battle, liberating themselves from shackles. This was one of the few slave rebellions in which we know for sure the enslaved population pulled from African culture and spirituality to spearhead the revolution. The Haitian Revolution was one of the largest rebellions in human history and so you would think another large rebellion like the Stono Rebellion would pull from a similar source to start its righteous movement. The Stono Rebellion in 1739 was one of the largest and costliest in the history of the United States. In studying it, historians have generally not appreciated the extent to which the African background of the participants may have shaped their decision to revolt or their subsequent actions. In some ways, the failure to consider the African background of the revolt is surprising since a number of historians have recently explored the possibility of African religions, cultures, and societies playing an important role in other aspects of South Carolina life. The Stono Rebellion was said to have been started by a man named Jemmy on September 9, 1739. He and a core group of so-called Angolan slaves led the charge on a Sunday. Ironically, a European power at the time was said to have encouraged the enslaved Angolans in their decision to fight. The Spanish were suspected in the uprising because, according to the account, the slaves were Catholics and the Jesuits have a mission and school in that kingdom and many thousands of the Negroes profess the Roman Catholic religion. In addition to the sentiments of a common religion, many slaves could speak Portuguese, which was as near Spanish as Scotch is to English, thus increasing their receptivity to Spanish offers and propaganda. It's not conclusive as to whether Spanish propaganda or offers were at the core of the decision, but it's certainly plausible. The Angolans took storefronts and got firearms, marching onward to freedom, gathering crowds, waving banners, dancing and beating drums. When they reached a number of about 90 enslaved people, they were finally met by a militia who successfully dispersed the group. Afterwards, small skirmishes took place as they reformed to continue on to the Spanish territory of St. Augustine. The enslaved Africans are often called Angolan because they were likely taken from the Kingdom of Congo which ironically at the time was a Christian empire officially. Congo had an extensive system of schools and churches and many of the people there were bilingual, speaking Kakongo and Portuguese. Many Congolese elite considered Christianity as a part of their identity and the Mwene Congo or Kings of Congo had relationships with Rome independently. These observations by travelers in Africa were seconded by occasional clerical observations in the Americas where Congolese slaves were well known to be Christians. Unfortunately, however, during the 18th century, Congo suffered from many lengthy civil wars which not only deteriorated statehood but also created an atmosphere where the free and the enslaved could be shipped off to Brazil and America. Many of the enslaved people from the Congo region were war captives and were well trained militarily speaking. 
One of the features of African parentage involving the Stone Rebellion was surprisingly the ability to use firearms. Soldiers in Congo would have certainly had training in the use of firearms. By the 18th century, guns were becoming more common on African battlefields, but the colonial militia in America did not allow that sort of privilege amongst enslaved Africans to be prevalent in the least. In reference to the Stono Rebellion, the rebels quickly seized a supply of guns and apparently handled them well. The utility of guns in a revolt is directly proportional to the skill with which the rebels are capable of using them, and this, in turn, is dependent on training. Presumably, those unfamiliar with guns might have sought other weapons such as knives, axes, or agricultural tools and passed up a raid on an armory. Because the colonial militia did not provide much in the way of firearms training, the possibility of an African source of training seems more likely. Further evidence concerning the African influence on the Stoner Rebellion was the presence of banners, drums, but more importantly, the war dance. Even though local American militias had similar elements, they did not have a war dance. This unique aspect strongly reveals the Africanity of the Stono Rebellion. Military dancing was a part of the African culture of war. In African war, dancing was as much a part of military preparation as drill was in Europe. Before 1680, when soldiers fought hand to hand, Dancing was a form of training to quicken reflexes and develop parrying skills. Dancing in preparation for war was so common in Congo that dancing a war dance, sangamento, was often used as a synonym for to declare war in 17th century sources. It's interesting that one Portuguese commander acknowledged the Congolese skill with muskets so it would seem as though many of these so-called Angolan rebels in the Stono Rebellion had military experience in Congo and clearly knew how to handle guns. Even the way they fought was indicative of a Congolese style. Their tactics seemed crude to observers, but according to John Thornton, the Europeans' idea of a proper military formation was based on the necessity created by cavalry of maintaining a close order at all times. Indeed. The European musketeer of the 18th century was a converted pikeman, just as his musket with bayonet was a combination pike and missile weapon. In Central Africa, where there was never a large or effective cavalry, the musketeer was more likely to be a converted skirmisher. Central African musketeers in the 17th century often opened engagements with random fire from covered positions to weaken enemy infantry. Thus, the Stono rebels were not revealing their rude origins when they fought in the way they did. Instead, their tactical behavior was perfectly consistent with tactics of the battlefields of Congo. They withdrew after a brief encounter, relocated, and fought several battles over a protracted period, a pattern typical of Angola. The African military influence on the Stono Rebellion needs more research to solidify this particular perspective, but the evidence so far is pretty compelling. It would be a lot to expect a small group of enslaved Africans to defeat local American militias, but it's interesting to discover that they may have pulled on the experiences and training of their beloved homeland in order to fight for freedom. Well, I'm all guys. If you like these videos and want to help in this continued production, consider supporting the home team on patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.